yeah can we have kung pray for us please and then we'll get started okay i think uh, kung is not available uh, would asha be there would you be able to pray for us asha so that we can you know Pastor, yeah can she pray in my mic Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your kindness and love. And thank you all for everything as we gather together in your community and learn how to know truths and your word and what you have to say, God. I thank you for Pastor Deepika God. She's pouring out, Lord, the truths of our lives and helping us to nurture and be nourished, God. Thank you, God, for the time we are together in learning and also to grow in wisdom and knowledge, so that we may not just learn, but the doers of what we learn, God, and hear, Lord. Thank you so much for this class. Let your will be done and not ours, God. We may we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we will uh, today cover First Thessalonians. Um, we'll try to cover as many verses as possible. You know, in, our, um, in all of the five chapters which are there, and um, I suppose next class would be uh, Second Thessalonians. You know, next week. So uh, this week, we will uh, try to complete 1 Thessalonians. And uh, next class, we would be having 2 Thessalonians. So we are almost done with our uh, course for this semester. All right, so uh, let's get started. Um, so uh, we will begin with 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, and now, in this particular letter, uh, it looks like as if there are two or three um, things that the Thessalonian believers were not very clear about. And so uh, Paul just addresses those issues. OK, so we don't have much um, background to discuss regarding this particular letter. Uh, it's just Paul writing to them uh, to address some one or two things which the believers probably had not been very clear about earlier. So he's just giving them this information. Most of the letter is, in fact, very, very um, personal. Um, where Paul is pouring his heart out uh, to these believers, uh, telling about how deeply he appreciates uh, you know, their faith. And uh, he talks about the deep love and concern that he has for them. He also expresses his admiration for them, for the way they are you know, holding on in the faith. And it's just this one or two little things that they don't seem to be having much clarity about. And so he's writing the letter just to, you know, um, to give them information regarding these matters so that they will be even stronger in their faith. OK, so um, uh, that's just a very brief background to this letter. So we will begin with uh, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, if uh, we could have somebody read out for us verses 2 and 3, please. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Yeah. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Yes. So over here, um, it's sounding very similar to what we already saw in Colossia, you know, in the, in the letter to the Colossians. There it talked about faith, hope, love and here again you have the very same theme being repeated where it talks about the work produced by faith i know uh, by these believers it talks about the labor which has been prompted by their love and it talks about the endurance inspired by uh, hope uh, so uh, very similar to the same things which motivated the colossian believers so we kind of get the impression that these three things are going to be very, very fundamental for even us in our Christian walk. You know, so um, what are these three things? Uh, first, of course, is the faith. Um, 
all that we do we we do it out of our faith in jesus and uh, faith you know like we had talked about in the last class um, faith expresses itself in two ways uh, first uh, we have faith in jesus uh, that he knows what is best and so we choose to obey you know whatever he's telling us to do uh, and then our faith also expresses itself in the in in the sense that we we don't believe that we can do this work on our own ability we trust him to be uh, to equip us to do the work which he has given us so uh, the work which these Thessalonian believers were doing it was produced by their faith in Jesus. They were doing it because they really trusted him and were willing to obey him and do what he was saying. And the other thing that we see is that um, their, uh, their, the work that they were doing it, they did not think that they could do it in their own strength. They were trusting him to provide them with the ability to do it. So their work was motivated by uh, the faith which they had in Jesus. And all this work which they were doing, they were doing it out of love love for the Lord, gratitude for the Lord for what he had done, and also a genuine love and concern for the people. And the third thing that we see, uh, they had this uh, endurance inspired by hope. So uh, we know we will see later on in this letter that the Thessalonians were in fact uh, undergoing great persecution, much suffering. Now in, in, that, in the midst of that suffering, they endured, they held on in hope um, uh, why because uh, you know uh, their hope was placed in the lord jesus that he would come back and you know uh, receive them that he would take um, take them home to be with him and so this hope uh, gave them the strength to endure even though they were going through great suffering so uh, even in our own personal walk uh, we should be kind of you know looking at these uh, three things um, is faith motivating the things which I am doing um, and uh, am I doing it all out of an attitude of love towards the Lord and towards people and third uh, because of the hope which I have in Christ you know I should be able to endure uh, so these three things is what we would look at even in our own Christian walk now moving on to the um, next uh, portion uh, if we could have someone read out for us verses four and five please First Thessalonians verse four and five. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Uh, yeah, okay. So over here in our verses four and five, um, he says the gospel message which we gave to you. It was not given simply with words, but also with power. Now, this is something which he, uh, you know, uh, talks about even in Corinthians, where he says, you know, I, I do not use big words to present the gospel to you. All I did was I presented the simple facts about the gospel, and it was the power of God which did the work. Okay, so um, in that, in in those biblical times, uh, Greek oratory. You know the the Greek speaking, the Greek speeches, uh, they were considered very, um, very something very big. So if somebody could speak in that Greek oratorial style and give a long lecture in a very most uh, inspiring way with with deep philosophical thoughts, you know, expressed uh, in their talk, uh, if they could do all of that then such people were uh, respected and they were praised as great orators. So uh generally when people would try to do any speaking or any teaching uh, in those days they would try to adopt this uh, greek oratorial style of speaking you know to show off how deep their knowledge is and uh, how good they are at impressing people uh, so that was basically how uh, speeches were done teaching was done in those days so Paul does the exact opposite. He says, I'm not going to try to impress people with my teaching skills. 
all I'm going to do is in plain simplicity, I'm just going to talk about the cross. And, you know, like we saw in all of the other previous, um, you know, uh, letters which we have been looking at, we saw that the cross was something that was regarded as something very low in those days. Um, people had a very low opinion of the cross. And so he, Paul says, even if people have this very, very low opinion of the cross, that's basically all I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach, you know, Christ crucified. And that's all I'm going to preach because there's going to be power in that. Uh, so the same thing he expresses over here when he says, you know, um, the gospel which came to you was not given with simply words, not with oratorial skill. Rather, it was actually given with the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. So these people who, um, you know, who placed their faith in Jesus, these Thessalonians, they were not just impressed by Paul's words. They were deeply convicted on the inside by the Holy Spirit in him, um, himself. A divine work happened in their hearts. Um, um, maybe, you know, we could have someone read out 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 to 5, please. First Corinthians 2, 4 to 5, it reads, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Amen. Yeah, you know, so it says over here, um, why why did paul not use you know um simply words why didn't he just use uh, you know that kind of greek style of talking to preach the gospel why because he wanted the faith of these you know hearers to rest upon god's power rather than you know his uh, showing off his speaking skills because you see paul would be preaching today and he would be gone tomorrow he would move on to the next destination and he would be giving his speeches over there in the next destination. Now, what happens to the people who have been left behind in this first place where he did his preaching, you know, where they all got very worked up and they said, wow, what a wonderful speaker. And, you know, oh, we are feeling so inspired by all the things that he said. Once he's gone, he's gone. He's no longer there to inspire them. And so we, we learn something very, very important regarding ministry, you know, from, from this uh, attitude that Paul had. He would not try to just stir up people's emotions through, you know, um, through inspirational talks. It is good to have inspirational talks, but that alone is not enough because, you know, people who, sit, who are sitting over there in the crowd listening to your inspirational talk, they will feel very inspired and then they'll go back home and then they'll face the same trials and difficulties which they have always faced and then they'll think, yeah, it felt so good sitting over there in the hall and listening to all of those big words and thoughts. But now here I am back home and I'm facing the same you know, problems that I've always had. On the other hand, rather than giving an inspirational talk, if that person had just stood over there and preached from the scriptures and explained, see, this is what God is saying in his word. Then when in their time of trouble, they can hold on to that word of God and the power of God the Holy Spirit, which is there in the word, would be able to, you know, help them and guide them in their problems. So the reason that Paul does not use big words, the reason he just simply presents the gospel truth is so that people's faith will not rest on human wisdom, but it will rest on God's power. So the power of God, which is there in that plain scriptures, that power will work in people's lives and change them and transform them. So which is why he says, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know, uh, so uh, that's one very important truth to keep in mind, you know, whenever we are sharing from the script scriptures. It is, of course, good to use some level of, you know, speaking skills and all of that. But are we conveying that? That, that scripture most clearly explaining it as simply as we can so that people will catch those truths 
the power in those truths is what is going to you know help them in their everyday life because god will take charge when they stand down those scriptures god will come through for them god will work on their behalf you and i we will do our talking and then we'll be gone we will not be there for those people in their trials they need to be directed towards god's power and so uh, it is so important how we preach the uh, scriptures to people uh, then he goes on to make another very important point um, uh, if someone could just read out for us verse 6 And you become follow, became followers of us and of our and of the Lord, having received the word in much application with joy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So um, these uh, here we we get to know that these uh, Thessalonian believers are living in the midst of severe suffering, and in the midst of this severe suffering, uh, they choose to become imitators of the Lord. Why? Because the plain scripture has been told to them. So they have not gone away thinking about how wonderful Paul is as a speaker. They have gone away thinking about the Lord whom Paul was talking about. And so they become imitators of the Lord. And another thing, they become imitators of these apostles who are sharing the gospel. Uh, why? Because these apostles are you know, literally sharing out of their life. Uh, they are they are um, they are um, presenting themselves as an example of how to live. Uh, that is what we see in verse five. It says the words have come to you with power and the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. It also says you know how we lived among you for your sake. So through their lifestyle also they taught. So two things: if you wish to be a powerful teacher, um, two things. First explain the scriptures as simply and as clearly as you know how with the help of the holy spirit second let your lifestyle show um, what you stand for you know uh, your christian walk so people will become imitators of the lord that you're pointing them towards and they will also imitate your lifestyle the way you are living uh, so because of the impact that the lifestyle of Paul had on these people, because of the impact that uh, the, the, script, the, the simple scriptural teaching had on their lives, something happens to these people. Look, look at the effect, look at the impact that it has on these people. Verses 7 and 8, if, if someone could read out, verses 7 and 8. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone, has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Yeah, so these people, they watched Paul. They watched his lifestyle. And they listened to the uh, simple gospel message, which was clearly pointing them towards the Lord. And then they became imitators of Paul. And then what happens? All the other believers in that region, the people living in the entire region of Macedonia and Achaia, they start imitating these believers. So you see, the believers imitated Paul and imitated the Lord Jesus. And they became more like Paul and like the Lord Jesus. And when they started living in a very distinct and different way, the people living in the entire region of Macedonia and Achaia were so impressed by them that they began to imitate these Thessalonian believers. And uh, it says, your faith in God has become known everywhere. And so they have be now become a model for all the other believers. And it all starts off with Paul just simply pointing these people towards the Lord and through his own lifestyle, showing them uh, what it is to live the Christian life. It all started with that. And then these Thessalonian believers, they go on to become a model for the people living in that entire region. Um, and um, 
uh, yeah, some details are given about that in verses 9 and 10. Um, if someone could read out, please, verses 9 and 10. 9 and 10. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned God from turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus who rescues us from coming wrath so everyone in this entire region is talking about them and talking about the faith the very simple faith that they had because once they heard the gospel what did these people do it says they turned away from their idols and they began to serve the living and the true god um yeah, uh, uh, and uh, you know in the earlier verse in verse 6 we saw that they are in the midst of severe suffering um and uh, so it looks like when they turned away from these idols they were very deeply persecuted by their neighbors you know by their families uh, it looks like that's what happened but they continue to hold on it says over there in verse 6 it says in the midst of severe suffering you know they they held on with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So um, they just relied on the Holy Spirit and the hope which he is placing in their heart. And what is the hope that they have? Uh, that is explained in our verse 9 and 10. Uh, they have turned to serve the living and true God. Why? Because they are waiting for his son to come back from heaven and to collect them and take them to their you know, to their eternal home. Because Jesus said, I will go and prepare a place for you. And if I'm preparing a place for you, I will come back and I will collect you. So they have this hope. And so they turn their back on all of the idols and uh, they begin to follow this true and living God, eagerly waiting for the day when Jesus will come and collect them and take them, you know, uh, and, and like it says over here, who will rescue them from the coming wrath. So they have been deeply convicted by the Holy Spirit of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. It's purely a work of the Holy Spirit that has taken place in the hearts of these Thessalonian believers. And uh, so now they are enduring in hope of Jesus' return, that he will come and collect them and you know take them uh, to his eternal home. Uh, so we, we basically see this in the in first chapter. Now, moving very quickly into chapter two. Um, in chapter two is where Paul starts talking about uh, how much he has, you know, emotionally invested in these believers. And he also uh, praises them and commends them for their own sincerity in how they are following the Lord. So it, it it's more a personal thing that's discussed in chapter two. Uh, him and his feelings and how he has invested in them and these believe these believers in Thessalonica how they have uh, uh, chosen to take a stand for God and the sufferings that they have gone through uh, for the Lord all of that so um, maybe we can start off by looking at verses 1 and 2 first Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, verses 1 and 2 please you know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Yeah, I mean, now. Uh... You know, when we read the Philippian letter, we were not really told much about what the apostles went through, uh, you know, in sharing the gospel over there. But here, you know, some light is thrown on that. It says we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, which means they must have gone through some extremely serious trials and difficulties. You know, Paul and the other apostolic team, they went through extremely great difficulties when they were ministering and sharing the gospel in Philippi. And so it says, you know, the, Paul says, uh, we dared to tell you the, the gospel only with the help of our God. After what they had gone through in Philippi, it's like they almost didn't have the guts to share in Thessalonica, because even over here, it says, you know, in the face of strong opposition. 
So in Philippi, they've already been treated outrageously. So do, we do not know what kind of humiliations they were subjected to over there. Now, after that experience, they're almost feeling afraid to share the gospel here in Thessalonica because there is strong opposition uh, over here. And it says that they were able to dare to do that only with the help of our God. So it was not something very easy and effortless that Paul and his companions did. It cost them a lot. They went through a, a, a deep suffering just to bring the gospel to these people. And there was a lot of opposition that they faced. And um, uh, so in verses 3 and 4, uh, Paul goes on to say, yeah, if someone could read out, uh, verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. Nor are we tricking to trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. Yeah, in fact, almost all the wording used, you know, in the second chapter, third chapter is like uh, very, uh, you know, uh, of inspiring wordings it says over here that god has tested the heart of paul and his team and you know he has declared them as people uh, you know approved you know it's like as if he tested their hearts examined their motives and you know put a stamp on them saying yes approved these are people that i can entrust with the gospel you know it kind of makes us think when he looks at us you know those of us who are in ministry when he tests our hearts, what does he see over there? Uh, what motivates us uh, to uh, to you know work in Christian ministry? Uh, so when God tests us, does he say, yes, these are approved people. I fully approve of them. And uh, you know, I now consider them you know um, qualified to take the gospel forward. That is, is that what the Lord would say about us? So uh, here in, in Thessalonians, very high standards are being set, uh, you know, for people, especially who have been called, uh, you know, to ministry. Uh, so how are we serving? Uh, with what motives and with what attitude are we serving? You know, and um, uh, uh, and he, then, he, yeah, then he goes on to say in verses 5 and 6 and 7, uh, if someone could read out, 5, 6 and 7, please. 5, 6 and 7. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. And verse 7. Apologies, sorry. Verse 7. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. Uh, yes. So here, uh, you know, Paul says, you know, we lived among you literally day and night. We lived, we lived among you. So you know exactly I mean, what we did, how we spoke, how we worked. It was all there, you know, because literally they lived out their lives in front of these people. Nothing was hidden. So he he says, uh, as you very well know, you know, we didn't try to flatter you. We didn't try to you know uh, win your praise uh, in the hope that maybe you'll start supporting us financially. You know, we we could have asserted ourselves, you know, and said you need to, you need to start you know supporting us. We didn't do that. We were just it was just enough for us that we could take care of you like a nursing mother. And uh, so we see uh, in this entire passage that Paul's attitude, what he feels towards these believers is the, is the feelings that a nursing mother would have towards a little baby. I mean, we all know about nursing mothers and their babies, right? At that stage, uh, the baby will keep the mother up day and night. I mean, the mother hardly gets to sleep. Uh, it's like a very trying, very exhausting process. But at no point does the mother you know, uh, say, oh, what am I going to get out of this? 
what material gain am i going to get out of this the mother has no expectations on no you know of that kind you know not as she do not as she look after the baby just to get the praise of people and you know so people will say oh what a devoted mother she is no even if nobody is watching even if nobody is praising she simply keeps nursing and caring for that little baby out of love it's just pure simple love towards the child not that she's going to get any material gain out of it nor is it because she's going to get any praise from people for it she's just catering to that little child you know who keeps her awake day and night she does it simply out of love and so paul says you know that is how we have felt about you um and then he goes on to say in verses 8 9 and 10 yeah, if someone could read out 8 9 10 It's nine and ten. So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be burdened to anyone, while we preached the gospel of God to you. you are witnesses and so is god of how holy righteous and blameless we were among you who believed you know so he's he's talking to these people and they know all the facts so he's not bluffing in any way you know if he were you know uh, lying they would easily have caught the lie they would have said ha huh, you're writing this now but we all know what happened when you were actually living among us you know they would have caught the lie but here what paul is writing is facts something which these people have seen with their own eyes and so he says we loved you so much you know that we were delighted to share our lives with you uh, so um, you know the, the 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 that that nursing mother you know she is not doing it for any kind of payment she delights in just giving her energy her time you know her entire life to just looking after that child and she's not doing it for any gain she's just doing it out of love uh, and it, and it actually brings her delight to to do that for her child and paul says that is how we felt about you people and so you know the the nursing mother doesn't demand from the baby saying now you pay me i've been uh, you know sitting up for three nights in a row now you pay me no i mean there's no such expectation at all and so here we have paul and his team adopting the same attitude they don't expect anything from these believers they don't want to be a burden to them you know they don't want the believers to have to support them and so it's he says over here um we worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone so they did the ministry work and then beyond that they also went and you know earned a livelihood for themselves so that these believers would not feel the burden in any way uh it's just the most amazing selfless kind of uh ministry that that has ever you know been worked out uh by people uh so uh, it, these are very high standards of ministry that are being set for us over here uh, you know in these verses um uh going into verses 11 and 12 Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, how did they deal with the believers? Verses eleven and twelve. For well, you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into His kingdom and glory. Yeah. And so uh, it says here that uh, they that. paul and his uh, team they were dealing with these believers as if they were own children you know i mean uh, we tend to notice this right when it comes to our own children we we are more forgiving uh, we are more patient uh, we will go the extra mile uh, you know uh, with the other maybe with other children maybe we will be a little more sharp and little more stern and not really think things through but when it comes to our own kids because it's there in our heart that love that is there we are just more gentle and we are willing to give more second chances and all of that so here he says you know we 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 have been we we used to encourage and comfort the two greek words that are used over there for encourage and comfort it it's almost like 
uh, synonyms. It's like as if he's saying, you know, we gave you um, comforting encouragement. Because, you know, encouraging can be done in two ways uh, by human parents. Uh, you have uh, fathers who will encourage their children, you know, to achieve higher levels by threatening them, by scaring them. Uh, and, you know, th that's a kind of negative way of, you know, forcing them uh, into a higher level. On the other hand, you have fathers who will be uh, gentle and firm, and uh, they will not scare the child, you know, into withdrawing. Rather, they will be very comforting in the way they uh, encourage the child, so that, the, so that uh, rather than the child disappearing into its shell, the child will develop the courage to go and try out new things. So there's a comforting kind of encouragement, and there's a kind of a threatening kind of encouragement that can be given. And over here, these the Paul and his team are careful to give the right kind of encouraging, comforting, and urging. You know, even as they're uh, even as they are teaching these people to live lives that are worthy of God. And uh, even as I was just looking at that particular verse, you know, I, uh, the scripture that came into mind uh, was about Jesus Himself. And how he describes his teaching style. Uh, so if maybe you know if we could just uh, quickly look at Matthew chapter eleven, verse twenty nine. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your soul. You know, that's one distinctive feature of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is gentle and humble in his teaching. Oh, I'm not saying he doesn't correct. He definitely corrects. He can be very strict at times. You know, uh, sometimes when we are, you know, heading off in the wrong direction, he can be very, very firm in bringing us back. He will not be careless with us. He's very careful. I mean, he does not want to lose us. So, you know, he will be quite sharp and stern, if especially if we are walking off into danger. But uh, generally, when we are submissive and we are willing to learn from him, he is very gentle and humble in the way he teaches us. As long as we are open and receptive, uh, we, we, we see a very uh, gentle and humble teaching style. So he is a comforting encourager, the, our Lord Jesus, in the way he teaches us. Of course, when we uh, when we become rebellious, when we refuse to hear his voice, then he has to take sterner measures, and he's loving enough to do that. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we see that uh, he's a gentle encourager, and uh, the apostles too, in the same way, they were comforting encouragers. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, then maybe we can move on into verse um, thirteen. Yeah, just verse thirteen. Yeah. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed, you welcomed it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth. The word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Yeah, so um, he, he says over here, when we presented the gospel to you, you didn't just think of it as a nice human philosophy. You understood that these are literally the words of God that are being given. They are a divine revelation that is being given. And so it should be believed, it should be accepted, it should be practiced. So uh, the believers, these Thessalonian believers, didn't take it lightly. They realized that this is not just a nice bunch of instructions. No, this is in fact a divine commandment, a divine revelation. Uh, you know, that is being given by God. And so because they approached the, the word which was being given to them with the right attitude, you know, of reverence, of submission, of obedience, because they did that, it says this, this word is at work in you who believe. So the word of God began to work in them. And uh, as a result of the word of God working in them, Amazingly powerful things happened. Uh, verses 14, 15, 16. If someone could read out. Verses 14, 15, 16. 14, 15, 16. For you, brothers and sisters, become became imitators of God's churches in Judea, 
which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone. In their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, in this way, they also heap up their sins to the limits. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. So, uh, because they understood that the things which are being told to them are not just some nice thoughts from Paul's head, rather this is divinely from God that is being, you know, these words which are being given to them. They respected that. They submitted to that. And uh, so they were willing to go through the persecution in the same way the church in Jerusalem went through persecution. In the same way, the Jewish people persecuted the new believers who were accepting the Lord in Judea and Jerusalem and Judea. In the same way here, these Thessalonians, they suffered at the hands of their you know, heathen neighbors, uh, at the hands of the, uh, the, of the other idol worshippers. So in the same way that, so Paul is stating over here that to the extent that the Jerusalem church suffered, to that extent, even these people have undergone suffering. Because, you know, we, we know one thing about the Jerusalem church. They went through very, very difficult times because um, that entire culture was a Jewish culture. And these believers are now going against the Jewish traditions. So the entire society would just cut them off. You know, you would no longer be invited for anything. If you're going down the road, they would probably spit out, spit on you. Uh, you would nobody would want to employ you. You know, nobody's going to give you job opportunities. Literally, you know, looking after your family on a day-to-day -day basis would become difficult. They went through a great struggle, the people in um, the believers in Jerusalem and Judea. And he says over here that these people, these Thessalonians, have suffered to that extent where they have been, you know ostracized by their community, uh, where they are being treated as outcasts, and they have gone through all of that. Why are they able to go through all of that? It's because the word is at work in them, that convicting part of the Holy Spirit, you know, that, that strengthening part of the Holy Spirit, which is there in them, uh, that is sustaining them. So it's such a good thing that Paul and his team did when they just simply presented the gospel in its simplicity. They didn't use big words. They didn't use oratorial skills. They just simply imparted the word of God as it is. And the power of God, which was contained in those simple words, began to work in these people's lives. And it led to such a great work, divine work inside them, that they were willing to endure persecution you know, and go through all of that. Um, yeah, it, it, just to kind of touch upon that, Galatians 2.10, if someone could read out, Galatians 2, verse 10. Galatians 2, verse 10. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Uh, here, actually, you know, this pass. Um, if you were to look at the entire passage over there in Galatians, uh, this is basically when Paul visits Jerusalem for a for a short period of time, and so at that time, there's some discussions that go on, and then at that time, you know, the those the leaders over there in Jerusalem, they say just one thing that we are asking from you: please continue to show, you know, um, support for the poor. And over there, they're actually talking about the poverty-stricken believers of Jerusalem because they had been completely cut off from the economic system. Uh, they were in a, in a, in a extremely uh, you know, difficult situation. And so they, they needed the help of other churches to, in fact, be able to survive from day to day. Uh, and uh, so that was the condition in which the Jerusalem church was. And now here, Paul is testifying and saying that you, Thessalonian believers, have undergone suffering to the same level that the uh, that the Jerusalem church, you know, went through. Uh, so uh, he has a very high opinion of them. Uh, you know, coming very quickly into chapter 3, um, maybe we can uh, read out one large chunk, um, because here 
Paul is expressing uh, his deep concern uh, for them. Uh, how he was so anxious because you see he was aware of the of the strong opposition that they were facing and he was wondering how they are holding up and he didn't have news you know because now it's so easy you can just make a phone call and find out how the person is doing but back then uh, you know uh, it, it would take ship travel you know all the way sh traveling by ship from one place to another just to gain information about how those people are doing uh, so um, uh, if you look at these uh, verses, it talks about the, the anxiety that Paul was feeling on behalf of these Thessalonian believers, uh, you know, and it's so beautifully uh, expressed in these, in these verses, in these words which Paul uses to talk about what he's feeling in his heart, you know, for these people. Uh, so um, if... Uh, if we could read out verses 1 to 5, uh, this First Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborers in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these applications for yourself. Know that we are appointed to this, for in fact we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer do it, I sent you know your faith, lest by some means the temptator had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Yeah, so two times in verse 1 and again in verse 5, he says, you know, in the NIV way, way the wording is more simple. Uh, he says, uh, when we could stand it no longer. And he again says that, you know, in verse 5, for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. So uh, Timothy has been a great help to them in their, in their ministry in Athens. But it's all right. They don't mind uh, getting along without Timothy. They would like to send Timothy to go back to the Thessalonians and, you know, give them encouragement, help, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, exhort them to hold on in faith because he's so worried that maybe because of this intense persecution, they, you know, they will drop the faith and go back into the world. And he's so concerned for them like a parent. And so he thinks it's better off, you know, we, we can manage without Timothy, even though Th Timothy is so important for the ministry in Athens. You know, he's like, it's all right. You know, we'll manage without Timothy. Let Timothy go back. Let him go there and you know encourage them and build them up so that they'll be able to remain strong in the faith. You know when you when you when you're reading these wordings, it really literally you know makes you picture a parent who's so anxious about the child. Let us say you know that the child has now gone to a boarding school for the first time, and now the parent every day is thinking, oh, how is the kid getting along? How is the how is he adjusting over there? Uh, what's going on? Is he able to make friends in that new place? And uh, you know, is he holding on to the godly values which we you know which he has been taught? The, you know, every day the parent's concern is the parent is uh, staying over here in this city. But his entire heart is over there in that boarding school with the child, you know, because he's so concerned for the child. And that is the picture that we get of Paul over here. I mean, it's amazing. I think this is a divine love which God had put, you know, in the hearts of this apostolic team for the people, because nobody on their own can have that kind of a love. So when they say that we, you know, we, we have been dealing with you like our own children, they literally meant it. They were really they really felt for these believers like as if they are actually their own children, you know, birthed spiritually. Uh, so, uh, so that is the level of concern that you know Paul has for the for the believers, and so he sends Timothy to them. He says it's all right, you know, we, we can manage without you. You go over there, you know, you talk to them, encourage them, and come back. And uh, so uh, uh, we see the heart of Paul uh, in this. Um, yeah, uh, Brother Shai, you have raised your hand. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, sorry to take you back to the previous chapter, mm. but I, I just also wanted to bring up something on the latter part of that chapter where Paul longed to see them. Um, isn't it interesting that um, though he wanted to come again and again and again, mm. well, he testifies here um satan blocked their way 
um, just uh, I understand um, that uh, we face spiritual opposition, but you know, one would wonder, and this is not to exalt Paul, Paul, who was, uh, who had great revelation about the spiritual realm, you know, he mm -hmm. tells us here that Satan blocked their way. So I don't know, maybe he could throw more light that how come we wasn't able to break through, you know, how come Satan actually limited them from going, you know, to see them? I, I just, uh, just, uh, I just wanted to <laughs> get more. Um, light on that yes thank you Bhante. Uh, yeah the, the very brief answer okay okay i you know we are a little over time so it's all right you know we will take we'll get our 10 minute break okay so but let's just you know finish with this and then we will take our break so you will get your you know full uh, 10 minutes uh yeah uh so um there are times when the Lord allows difficulties and trials to come right so in this particular uh, on this particular occasion God does allow Satan to block off this opportunity to go and encourage them. Uh, so uh, sometimes when these negative things happen, God permits it in his divine will because he has already made other divine arrangements to take care of that particular issue. So over here, when Paul could not personally go to these people and build them up in their faith, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit administered to those people in other ways. So nothing was lost. God permitted it, God permitted the block, but God took care of the situation. So when, when something happens and we pray against it and uh, things don't change, we don't need to worry because God is still in charge and God will make other divine arrangements to take care of, of you know, whatever is, uh, needs to be done. Uh, so there are times when God will allow a trial or difficulty to come in which will prevent and block something from something good from taking place and of course at that point of time we will we will go down on our knees and we will pray and we will say oh lord you know unblock this open the path but if god says no it's okay you know i have other i have something else in mind and i'm going to deal with this in a different way it's up to the lord and uh, because one thing we learn is that uh, even though paul was stopped by satan from going over there the Thessalonians did not fall. They did not falter. In fact, when Timothy comes back with a very good report, uh, with a very joyous report, so Satan tried a tactic. He tried to block off what uh, you know what Paul probably would have done over there. He blocked it off. Thought he had succeeded very grandly, but then the Thessalonians did were not affected in any way. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit would have, you know, administered to them in some other, uh, maybe through other people or in some in some other manner, and they remained strong. So sometimes, yes, God allows a negative trial or uh, difficulty to um, to prevail, and He allows it, knowing that in His greater wisdom and power, He can make alternate divine arrangements to deal with that particular situation. Is, a, is what I suppose I would say. Um, there may be other ways also of looking at it, but this is basically how um, I kind of thought about it. Uh, does that help at all? <laughs> oh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, um, we'll come back after the, the break. So, now it's 9.54. So in that case, we will come back at 10.4, all right? So we'll log back in at 10.4, all right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 